Summer 2014. A young 11-year-old waltzes into a theater with some dear, dear friends. Today is a fateful day, as their lives will change forever, and they know it. The young boys go to see the legendary, the iconic, the insurmountable Godzilla. This was my first taste of the nuclear lizard, but it wouldn't be my last. However, I wouldn't say I am studied in the matter. I've always enjoyed the Legendary Pictures version of the monster, but never gone too far out of this sphere. Until now. Godzilla is so iconic and wonderful for countless reasons. Maybe it's the long and rich history, maybe the iconic, easily distinguishable design, or maybe the sheer versatility of the character. We can get a masterclass of storytelling about the failings of bureaucracy, or the feebleness of the human condition, and also the most rad and absurd giant monkey fight you've ever seen, and they are all 10 out of 10 stories. A full decade after our first encounter, I will once again face the kaiju and embark on a journey to fully realize my title as a Godzilla fan. And I will start from the beginning and bring you along with me. But how am I going to do this? Because I wouldn't sit here and like rank every single Godzilla movie. That would just take forever, especially if I were to go in depth on my thoughts on each of the 36 fucking movies, which is weird to assume I've seen every single one in the span of three months. <laughs> Each movie will have a short and sweet synopsis and review by yours truly, which will then lead into the scientifically proven Godzilla tier list, which each entry will be ranked accordingly in. I'll be focusing mostly on Godzilla in these, obviously, so when we get to the middle parts where there's a lot of other shit going on, I won't focus on them too, too much. These are brief reviews and mostly how they pertain to our big lizard monster. My criteria when ranking these movies is as follows. Godzilla design and impact, human plot and relevance, and the monster action and plot. And then just overall quality of movie. Now, without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome one and all. This is Future James here to do the most important part of the video. The tier list. This is the crux this whole thing. In between every movie, we're going to come back here, have a little debrief, put the movie somewhere on this list. Now, screw all this introduction crap, you've heard enough. Let's go ahead and get started with the original 1954 Godzilla. Amazing. Never in my 20 years on this earth have I realized I am missing out. On something so good. Of course, the first entry in a seven decade long worldwide IP has to at least be good, but this still somehow surprised me. Everyone knows the story of the original Godzilla, the aftermath of World War II, and nuclear bomb testing unleashed, the ultimate power being the titular monster, who destroys Tokyo in his indifferent march, being a metaphor for the bombs dropped on Japan in the Second World War. But as a movie, with an already so clear and heavy theme, on the perils of war, there still stretches something deeper. In this film, Godzilla is treated as a full-on natural disaster, something that no matter what we throw at it, he will not stop. This leads to the incredibly engaging and thematically resonant plot of this movie, which is its wonderful human cast. Specifically, I adore Yamane and Serizawa. They, in specific, spearheaded the themes of the movie. Yamane's pure infatuation with the creature as something to be studied rather than destroyed speaks volumes to our nature as humans to just destroy what we don't understand or are afraid of. He highlights Godzilla not as this malicious creature, but a reactionary one that is doing this because of our actions, which Serizawa takes and goes even further with. His character was just phenomenal. Godzilla was born from the escalation of war. We created a weapon too powerful, and in response to that, something even stronger comes back in retaliation. Something nuclear warheads can't do anything against. Then it escalates one final time with the Oxygen Destroyer. That is the true central conflict of the movie. Not Godzilla's rampage, but the conflict within Serizawa to allow this terrifying weapon to be released. 
It is a beautiful and concrete moment when he decides to use the oxygen destroyer, but also condemn himself to death, as we as a species cannot be trusted with such a force, leading to a surprisingly grim finale with Serizawa dying with his creation. On top of all this beautiful storytelling, of course the VFX, acting, and everything else under the sun for this movie is just incredibly well done. I will go ahead and say it now, this is the only movie in the first half of this list that depicts Godzilla as terrifying. He can be incredibly menacing, but here it's different. There is a true helplessness here that is seldom recreated. Now immediately off the bat, I am completely changing this. Because this movie is so good, I don't think this really can apply to all. And, and knowing what is coming in the future, I don't want to limit myself here. So we're going to make a new tier right up at the top. And we're going to put Godzilla right up there. Godzilla Raids Again, the sequel released a year after the original, featured a drastic change to form and the reveal of a second Godzilla, which I can't lie, really caught me off guard. It was just surprising that these guys are not the same as the original. I just kind of always assumed they were, but anyway. In this movie, Godzilla returns and battles out with a fellow dinosaur called Angiris. Ang Angiris. Ang Angi. I'm gonna call him Angi. This one felt kind of off because it has a similar feel to its sequels with the wacky and craziness of monsters fighting, but feels tonally very contradictory and in line with the original. The catalyst for most of what happened in the movie was strange, and I didn't have the magic of the first one. However, there were, of course, some really cool set pieces and effects. Seeing Godzilla's first fight with another monster does have a lot of charm, I will admit, and it's a lot of fun seeing these two destroy the city around them in a more serious tone. Later on, the destruction these guys cause while fighting isn't portrayed as a horrific thing, really, but here it is, and I appreciate that, despite the tonal issues I mentioned. I do have some pacing issues with this, uh, I think it just felt weird, especially at the end, but I did think the final bit where they trap him in the ice was very clever and well executed, and this guy's death was quite sad. This one was good. Can't complain too much, um, but I do think this is going to fit right around the sea area. Um, I feel like a weatherman right now. This feels powerful. Anyway, I wasted an hour and a half watching this weird stupid recut and dubbed over film about classic 50s white man literally juxtaposed into scenes from the original movie all of the charm and heart of the original is completely lost here and feels so incredibly distasteful especially considering the time this came out mr steve martin makes every japanese character out as something to be pitied. Like objectively, yes, I do understand why this exists. That does not mean I like it. I'm mad I wasted my time on something that really did not add anything and solely took away. I'm making a new tier. Fuck this movie. Fuck this movie. Oh, King Kong, you rascal. This is the movie that really changed everything for the franchise. As a collaboration with the older American IP of King Kong, this movie sees the two titular characters duke it out. And despite that, this isn't the first time Godzilla fights another monster. It was the first truly impactful one. This movie set the pace for so many movies down the line we will get into, and it's clear to see why. It's fun, it doesn't take itself so seriously with plenty of funny moments and characters and overall a more upbeat tone, while still having a very strong theme of human's impact on the world with global warming, reawakening our lizard friend, as well as the dangers of marketing and greed. The natural progression of King Kong and Godzilla is a lot of why I prefer this to Godzilla Raids again. Most of the movie is set up for Kong and getting him off the island. Then they fight a few times and there's tension that gets built up as well as the humans had a more direct involvement in the other monster with his whole being taken to Japan. I love Kong in this. He is he is so, so goofy. I mean, Godzilla is too. Like, I, I have no idea what this is, but come on. Like, look at, this, look at this monkey. Look at the monkey. As we move forward, we're going to see a lot of bland, 
outlandish or just plain incredible human plot lines in these movies. The best ones have very influential and important things to say about the themes, while others are just there to give the movie a time bonus and a plot in between the monsters fighting. This had a nice, healthy balance that I really liked. The married couple was cool, the crazy advertising man was really enjoyable and comedic, and gave a more lighthearted feeling that, along with the addition of color, surprisingly, gave this movie the first drastic change in tone for me. I loved the final fight here, as the action was creative and intense, and you never truly knew who was going to win. I also enjoy the kind of ambiguous ending here, letting both champs get some respect. Now, I think this one is a classic. It's grand. It's good. It's goofy. I think we're going to put this right in the middle of the road. I think this is a great, good Godzilla movie. And I want to I I go ahead and preface this here. This tier list has no, has no F. Because I don't think there's any bad or obscene Godzilla movies, except for that one. That's why there's a whole separate thing just for you. I think D is about as low as we'll go with, you know, a, a particular movie in mind later down. But all these C movies, C is middle of the road. C is meh. B is good. All right, B is a good, good movie. I enjoy that movie. All right, so... Before you get all rioted up in the comments, just, just keep that in mind, okay? As far as I know, Mothra vs. Godzilla is revered as one of the best Godzilla movies, bar none. This one involves, of course, exploring Infant Island and Mothra's lore while evil capitalism tries to take advantage of Mothra's egg. Godzilla and his ever-present and indiscriminate carnage causes issues, so we are forced to beg for the dying Mothra's help which, after pushback, is reluctantly accepted. I really enjoyed these ladies, and all of the human characters were just fun. This one had a great story about the inherent evilness of those business tycoons and taking advantage of nature when we should be nurturing it. Along with this, I was taught Godzilla is based as fuck because he murdered these two losers. The tone in this one is once again a fairly drastic shift. Fairy-sized twins singing to a giant monster being one thing, but also in the designs and such. The suit here looks slightly floppy, but I don't mind. The effects and action here are ever improving, despite my personal taste of the action being a little bland in the final fight. I had a line in my notes <laughs> that said, I was told these two would be fucking, and they are not, so I'm very confused. And I think this shows my attitude towards this one best. It did not take long for these movies to get funky, and I love it. There's a moment where Godzilla drops like a whole tower on himself by accident, and this was my first sign of Godzilla's turn to a lighter tone. This dude would have never done that. But that's not a bad thing. It just shows he's a goober now. But despite the inherent goofiness, this one still presents itself much more sincere and serious than the previous monkey adventure. The human characters have a real and more personal investment that isn't just about we need to impress the boss straight from the beginning. Both stories have their merits, it's just so fascinating to see these movies that are honestly very structurally similar feel so different. I like the whole believing in the good in people theme and how everyone has a right to live before the gods. I think it serves a lot for the type of movie this is with some unbeatable godly monster and needing help to subdue him. Which serves into my favorite human plotline climax since the OG of them saving these kids. It gave them an active role while the monsters were tussling and shows the selfless nature we are capable of. With that, Mothra saves the day. Well, they both do and they are off towards the sunset. This one was just great. Now, Mothra versus Godzilla, originally I did kind of have at King Kong, maybe a little lower. But I think after some careful deliberation from our team, I'm going to put it up in A tier. I think it's that good. I think it belongs a little, a little above. It's, it's, it grew on me a little bit, I think, after watching it. But, uh, yeah good movie. So I've learned something watching this movie. The human characters have actually not a single thing of long-term relevance because this is Professor Miura in this movie. He was also Miura in the last movie, but this is now Koshindo, who is also Junko Nakanashi in the last movie. So these two characters we're interacting the entire movie. Then all of a sudden, she looks exactly the same, and yet she's a totally different person, while he retains all knowledge. Like, I understand she can play a different character, but this girl being someone else makes 
absolutely no sense because it still would have all been fine and made sense if she was just still who she was in the last movie. Anyway, I digress. This one is the first of many dives into the idea of alien invasion in the Godzillaverse. And on this first bout, I did really enjoy it. The idea of a more passive and helpful alien companion trying to warn us while we are too untrusting and cocky to listen until it's too late. Very cool. As is always involved with the alien plots, King Ghidorah, one of my all-time favorites, is the titular villain as he wreaks havoc on the world. Mothra must try to convince Godzilla and Rodan, another classic movie monster, to help defend Earth. This dynamic of a foreign monster whose goal is to destroy Earth, unlike these guys who view it as a home, despite their distaste for humanity, is really intriguing and a simply fantastic start for Godzilla's eventual turn to defender of Earth. Something I love as we move away from these movies being strictly Godzilla focused to a more monsterverse kind of thing, is there's always respect on Godzilla whenever he shows up. In this one, he isn't even mentioned or shows up until almost halfway in, but as soon as he does, it feels so good. He gets some tension built up before he pops in and just immediately takes the shine. Like, Rodan especially is also considered this malicious and imposing monster, with a very cool entrance, by the way. And like, yeah, him and Zilla have similar imposing vibes, but it's just so clear, even in this movie, that Godzilla is the OG. Nothing will beat how menacing he is, to the average person, and you can still feel the impact that original movie had here. In that line, all of the monsters are just so cool in this one, especially Ghidorah. Soon as he starts, he is incredibly menacing and shows how much of a threat he poses. I still love how psychedelic these little ladies are. Their singing was just a crazy and cool vibe that adds to the mysticism of Mothra a lot gives such a unique feeling to this universe that just can't be replicated. As Mothra is a definite major player in the world, I love seeing all the lore she gets being a personal favorite of mine. My favorite part of this is that, for the first time, we're getting kind of direct insight into Godzilla's thoughts. Him saying how we're always bullying him, kind of solidifying the fact we're what we've already known, being that they only do this because we keep trying to kill them. A good way to kind of change Godzilla from this malicious force to him being a passive defender of his home, which is meta, because that's kind of what this whole movie was for the Godzilla character in the real world. In the previous films, Godzilla may have gotten lighter hearted, but he's still the antagonist. This movie, however, by posing this extraterrestrial threat, paved the way for Godzilla's real life change of something that people would cheer for because of the booming popularity of Godzilla compared to other monsters. As well as I think this has some of the craziest action yet, with Godzilla suplexing a dragon and then them playing catch. You cannot tell me this isn't amazing. Now Ghidorah, got some issues here, but I... I think I'll put it right around King Kong. It's good. It's solid. But with the next entry, I just I just don't think it, it lives up to the preconceived hype that I will admit I had because of my love for this three-headed monster. I have been so scarred, I started to legitimately freak out when they started speaking English at the beginning, wondering if I got the wrong version or if this motherfucker had fooled me again. So, <laughs> before we even start, this movie is dubbed, right? But... This movie was filmed with everyone speaking Japanese, obviously, except this guy. He is speaking English the whole time, yet he is still being dubbed over. So it's all just like they, they're they talking to each other in two completely different languages. It's, it's, it's so, it's so funny to watch. Anyway, this movie was the first true crossover with Toho and an American studio, which tripled maybe even quadrupled the weirdness factor of any previous installment and dives headfirst into the campiest and best sci-fi thing you've ever seen. I can totally see how this isn't the most popular, it's weird, throws you into a weird scenario, and features Godzilla and Rodan getting abducted, but this one just blew me out of the park. The special effects for this one were just something else, and so, so incredibly impressive for the time. It's fun, it's weird, and it's action-packed on the human and kaiju side of things. Also, this, this is how you do aliens. They are immediately so off-putting, despite them being very clear about their passive and kind intentions, so you know it just isn't right. Honestly, all the performances were just amazing. These guys' chemistry is actually really charming and is some of the best main character interactions we've had in these movies since the first. Especially the American guy. 
he is actually, he's kind of sick. Classic Chad type and all. I'm usually not a fan, but he brings a great energy to the cast that kept me incredibly engaged. Especially when compared to a certain someone. Like, he was, he was kind of my guy. I had in my notes, uh, <laughs> willful power of humanity blonde man, because he has a moment where he just talks about the never-ending spirit of being human. It's, it's, he's perfect. This is also the first time where the main final conflict isn't really hinging on any giant monsters. The humans are the ones who have to save the day, not relying on the big guys. Which was great to see their agency. But that doesn't mean the monster battles weren't simply spectacular. Also, I just, I want to point out here, uh, we saw multiple firsts from Godzilla and how perfect he is. Um, he jumped. Godzilla victory dance. This is, this is a perfect move. This is a perfect movie. Also, Godzilla was straight up scrapping. Boxing at the end. Just, just, hands. Now... That we're here. Invasion of Astro Monster is the best one I've seen so far. I don't think I could put it in S tier really confidently yet, but I love this one. Honestly, it might. I don't. It might be slipping up. Who knows? Who knows? We're gonna have a final debrief down at the end. But this. This. I love this movie, okay? Coming off the heels of some crazy out-of-this-world adventures, we're taking a step back, bringing us to a more down-to-earth classic tale, both on the human and kaiju front. Ebora follows a young man trying to find his missing brother, which leads to him encountering the next big threat, Ebora, a giant crab monster with an evil organization who is trying to use Ebora to their malicious benefit. Off the bat, this one is just great, with a goofy dance marathon and some kids hijacking a yacht. Throughout the entire movie, these characters are just a joy to watch, especially Akira Takarada's character. Anytime he is in one of these movies, I just love him to death. Such a charismatic on-screen presence. His more morally ambiguous character in this one, including the larger and younger cast, leads this to be a great breath of fresh air from the usual dynamics this film series tends to have. When watching so many movies in a row like this, you tend to get tired easier of the repeated tropes over and over. And these movies have a lot of brother-sister-husband dynamics where one or the other party is trying to win the approval from the other guy, as well as either a bumbling idiot or a smart professor type. This one kind of takes a step back and sees this guy as somebody to be redeemed throughout the movie while also focusing on the brotherly bond between our main character and his missing bro, as well as just having the boys. We got the boys in this one. Anyways, these humans also have a very strong hand in the plot, only causing the giant monster ball by waking up Godzilla themselves and once again asking for Mothra's amazing help, plus thinking of the way to turn Ebra against the evil man. This movie is just full of fun and creative ideas, so much so it definitely could have stood on its own without Zilla and Monty, but of course, I'm very glad they were here. It's not free from issues, as I think some parts are a little too unexplained or rushed, but nothing too, nothing too bad. Especially considering how great Zilla was in this one. He had a great entrance, and he and Mothra's team up is exactly what I wanted, literally playing catch at one point with this lobster. Godzilla in this movie might be one of my favorites so far. I absolutely love his depiction as just this fucking dude. He's just having a good time. The lady helps him fight Rodan, and he just practically monster winks at her. Then he Elvis dances to destroy a fleet of planes. He Elvis dances to destroy a fleet of plants. This is of course due to Jun Fukuda, as this was his first Godzilla movie, and it most certainly won't be his last. Ishiro Honda, the mastermind behind the original, is a wonderful storyteller, but Fukuda's introduction to this series truly started Godzilla's turn to the kind of giant lizard you'd invite to your wedding. He also, in this movie, seems more contemplative. The movie takes time to give you close-ups on his eyes, like he's not a mindless creature, which we obviously knew already, but it's cool to see what he's thinking without having it spelt out, which is mostly thanks to the incredible body language and performance of Haruho Nakajima, who was the main suit actor for Godzilla up until 1972 in Godzilla vs. Gigan, which we will get to. But I wanted to go ahead and point out just how amazing he is in this role, especially with this upcoming movie and how much emotion and storytelling he is able to do with just moving his hands and head mostly. This suit is restrictive, obviously very few facial expressions are possible, and yet he manages a fantastic view into the thoughts and intentions of Godzilla. Just wonderful stuff. 
Look, he's playing with his little claw, bro. Come on. Even the people realized how cool he was at the end. I'm glad he's getting his good rap finally in this movie. And he gets a nice send-off moment, which is great to see. Now, from my understanding, loving this movie is strange, I think. This is my completely opinionated, completely biased tier list, so I'm going to put it right here in A. Because I love this movie. I don't know why. I, it's good. I just know I'm gonna get shit for this one, but I, I don't care. This is fucking peak. If you don't like Manila, suck my healthy nards. In this next entry, we're focusing mostly on this guy, who finds a lady living on an island where these researcher dudes are trying to solve global warming, yet also ultimate environmental terrorism at the same time. But these guys just don't matter, because they find a babyzilla, whom the big man himself shows up shortly after to come to the rescue of and raise and train in the ways of being the coolest monster on the block. Off the bat, this movie is full of weird cuts, kinda sporadic directing, but John Fukuda struck such a chord with my heart that I absolutely adore this movie. The vibe of this one seems totally different. Upbeat music for the intro, and just seemingly focused on a Godzilla-driven narrative, which, of course, we got. This movie is full of great character acting from both Godzilla and M Manila? His name is Manila? I love him. The chemistry constantly on screen between these two without a word ever spoken is pure magic and makes for so many adorable and great moments. Like Manila riding his dad's tail or seeing Godi be very rough on his kid yet still caring and he just wants him to be able to defend himself. There's a wonderful arc over the course of this movie that you see him go through openly caring for Manila more and more. Like, come on. Seeing him save his son at the beginning and then later again over and over is ju it's just magic. Fuck up the mantises, Goaty. Fuck him up. Again, Manila is just amazing. He has this constant innocence and curiosity all over him that I just couldn't resist adoring. This little guy is perfect. In particular, the scene where he's teaching him to roar and use the atomic breath is my favorite. Godzilla's clearly annoyed yet caring disposition mixed with the son's hesitant desire make for such a fantastic scene of character work while being just plain entertaining. Baby Godzilla, a hero of the people! There were some weird convoluted plot points here. I can't lie, the human part wasn't the best, but at least it wasn't boring. But this was so good on the monster front, I don't care. I have to forgive it. Look, he hugged him. He hugged him. That's, oh, that's my proud single father right there. Oh! I need you to hear me out here, okay? I, j I need you to hear me. I just explained myself. I feel like what I'm about to do has been validated, Is should be understood. Just, just bear with me, okay? This adventure sees Godzilla and every ghost of Christmas past coming to absolutely fuck up Ghidorah again. After being mind-controlled the whole movie. Again. Another alien invasion movie involving mind-controlling the kaiju, in all honesty, I wasn't excited. And most of the movie, I would only lock in when the big guys would start fucking shit up. Of course, the effects and score and acting from these guys were all just great, but the human plot just did not grab me. For most of the movie and considering this feels like a big build-up kind of movie bringing in all these players i expected more and i just didn't get it is what i would be saying if the last 30 minutes of this movie didn't exist screw everything i just said the fact remains that this movie's final bout is insane it's wacky it's out of the box and it is so cool there were plenty of moments where these guys would just explain random alien technology or whatever and the aliens were boring in comparison to some of the others we've gotten but overall as a movie it isn't the best i can't lie and i wasn't super invested but when manila showed up everything changed i'm i'm, I'm exaggerating i i love the monsters just messing stuff up especially the attack on tokyo i also loved the fact godzilla just started beating the shit out of Ghidorah, like he really hates that dude. He needs no instructions, he is just handing out whoop ass. My biggest complaint honestly is that King Kong didn't join, but uh, it's fine. Ghidorah... Ghidorah gets bitched a lot, doesn't he? Like, I, maybe it's my bad, I thought he was a lot more menacing than he, he kinda just... kinda just gets bitched a lot. Like a lot. Anyway. It's time for the March of Monsters, baby. Let's get it. I was really enjoying 
this kid's plot. I thought it was going to be a great change of pace, as well as getting vibes for a movie based on the effects of pollution and factory work. But, no. Clearly, I write notes while watching these, right? It helps me get my thoughts out, make sure everything that sticks out to me I jot down so I remember how I felt and what to talk about. And you can see in my notes, when I go from pumped up and excited to the slow, painful realization that the entire kaiju portion of this movie is in the kid's head. Yes, I was disappointed, but I could have dealt with it. But Manila talks. You think I'd, I'd be more excited, right? No, no. The entire charm of these characters, the whole point is removed when they can just talk. I know Manila does not have the best rap, and I could kind of see why. But I didn't feel that way at all until I saw this stupid shit. Like, I still love him when I ignore this movie, but I never want to see him talk ever again. And I'm issuing an apology to the Manila haters. I, I get it now. He is, he is awful in this movie. And also, most of the monster scenes are re-edited, reused scenes from previous movies, which in small amounts is fine. But here it is excessive. They edit a rock over Manila to reuse this fight without him. It also replays the entire finale of Ebera. I will say, this kid is very endearing, and the real-life plotline isn't atrocious, and had some heart that I don't want to go unnoticed. I had fun and liked what it was trying to do, but it just, I, I can't get behind it. I just can't. I understand, I see what they were trying to do, but it just did not work for me. At all. This is bad. This is bad. In Godzilla vs. Hedera, we see Godi turn sides in a thematic way, finally fighting off the fear of pollution, in contrast to his own previous embodiment of nuclear war. This one is very dark, in heavy contrast to the previous film, while still maintaining a wonderful amount of goof. I think this one, so far, is both the most stark in its different tones, and also the one that balances them the best. We see multiple groups of people completely melt in an objectively horrifying display, and yet we see Godzilla fly. For me, the return to form while still clearly taking the franchise in a new direction is just very refreshing. Godzilla gets a cool entrance as the clear hero of Earth, and Hedera is menacing, while having a very unique design and paired with the horrific aftermath of his sludge, he makes a great villain for us to root against. Also, this kid is the goat. He gutted a kaiju in the first 10 minutes. Godzilla is also very smart in this movie. Uh, we got a little human Godzilla team up, and I find it so funny that the only thing we did was build the contraption, but we couldn't even get it to work. Goaty had to do it himself. We're, we're so silly. And by the way, Godzilla's vicious beatdown of this dude is amazing. And honestly, one of my favorite kaiju battles, I think, so far. It's zany, it's creative, it's brutal, and it's cool. This movie is also full of very jarring early 70 movie syndrome, but it has the best parts I look for in these, so I can overlook the groovy ass editing. I don't know why I'm saying that like it's a like it's a bad thing though. My current thought process is that Godzilla is at his best when he's just a chill ass dude. Now this one is another one I've I've really debated on. I don't know whether to put it in A or B. I like it a lot. I think it's got some weird funkiness. So we're gonna Yeah, okay. That that feels good. That feels good. We've got another alien invasion story. This time with alien cockroaches making a Godzilla theme park to why why are they why are they making the theme park and why did they hire this guy and okay anyway it it leads to another alien controlled new monster in gigan a really cool yet strange design that i digged especially for reasons we'll get into later but i have to say this one hurt to watch not because i didn't like it it's got a very intriguing and engaging human plot of a wannabe manga artist uncovering an alien invasion mixed with a really cool and powerful antagonist. It was rough because you could see the difference in budget really hard here. And I hated to see it, but despite that, this movie still pulled through well past fucking All Monsters Attack. While the alien's big master plan was weird and the mystery to uncover them was weird, I still really enjoyed the human plot, mainly because of just how fun these characters are to watch, mainly the main three. I have ingested a lot of human plots at this point, and if 
one can really grab my attention, it's a major plus for the movie. Along with that, I actually kind of thought it was cute to have Godzilla and Angus, Angie, uh, Angie, have manga bubbles to show what they were saying and show their agency, uh, despite its clear corn. Speaking of, in this one we see the return of Angie, which I thought was cool because we've only seen glimpses of him in a long time. But man, he got some spotlight 20 years after his original appearance. Along with him, Ghidorah returns, this time to play support to Gigant. And despite the reuse of many past shots, the final battle was, was so good. Gigant's claw made this one of the most brutal beatings in the entire series so far, and because of the lack of special effects, they had a lot of cool teamwork, having almost wrestling-like moves to pull out here. Made for a lot of fun and a tense back-and-forth match between these four monsters. And I haven't mentioned it so far, but I like the new trend of at the end, them all saying goodbye to Godzilla after he saves the day. It's really cute. Now, Gigan. Now, this guy fucks. Alright, yeah, it's about the same as the last one. You know, good, solid movie. Nothing to complain about. I like Gigan. He's got a cool design. John Fukuda strikes again to bring us a zany and crazy battle between Godzilla and Megalon. But also featuring the mighty Gigan, as well as... Is is that, is that Jet Jaguar? I was never really an Ultraman kid, so I don't have that nostalgia factor here, but you know what I did have? Power Rangers. And when Jet Jaguar grew big for the first time, everything made sense. I flash back more than almost 15 years to sitting on my couch watching Power Rangers Jungle Fury. I yelped, I hooted, I hollered. The human plot here literally does not matter. This is about Jet Jaguar. I just don't care. And I want to simply read off of some of the notes here to express my feelings while watching. I don't know the mechanics of how this robot did it, but it's, it's nuts. It's insane. Jet Jaguar is my guy. His natural instinct was to gain the indomitable human spirit, bro. These two are guys, they're bros. Godzilla knows Jet Jaguar is him, he knows. Godzilla flying kick, oh flying kick. Obviously this is supposed to be mostly about Godzilla, but come on. It's clear this was originally a solo adventure for Jet Jaguar that Godzilla was added into to have more confidence in the movie. And I have no issues with this. The main reason being I got to watch this masterpiece on my binging journey. Also, I enjoyed the deviation from the norm with this one being about Atlanteans and not aliens. This one had lots to offer to differentiate itself, including some cool car chases and actual human fight scenes. The slow evolution into a straight up spy thriller is funny, which also reflects in the big guy as Godzilla is actually just doing martial arts here and it's so fucking stupid, I love it. This movie also struggles with some reused scenes, but I didn't mind it as much here. It was a little jarring, but never ruined a scene for me. At this point, Godzilla has fully become something the people of Earth rely on for help, where they are actively trying to get him to come save us, solidifying his full transition to the good guy side. And I just love the way they send Godzilla off. It's so charming, it's so sweet. But Jet Jaguar, he's gonna be here to save the day. Forever and always. Right there. This, also debated putting an S. Cause fuck y'all, this is for Jet Jaguar, this ain't for y'all, this ain't for me, this ain't for Goji, it's for him. I feel I don't even need to explain this one. Everyone knows who Mechagodzilla is, and for his first ever venture, it is quantifiably insane, and it's amazing. The spy shenanigans are turned up to 11 here, with an evil race of gorillas trying to do evil alien things, creating a robotic Godzilla. There's so many strange plot points, but they are overshadowed by some crazy fight scenes, action-packed chases, and several plot twists that in all actuality make no sense, but are fun nonetheless. In the first few minutes, we get one of the most brutal scenes in the entire franchise so far, where Angie is being beaten by Pseudo-Godzilla and is having his jaw ripped apart. Luckily he escapes, but that's my boy, don't do him like that. Speaking of, it's pretty apparent this is not the real Godzilla. Maybe it's because I have become one with the act of Godzilla movies over the past three weeks, or maybe because they 
weren't really trying to hide it, but it was fun to point out how just everything was wrong with him. Now, I will say, a major part of this movie is focused around King Caesar, and it feels weird. There's a scene where a woman does the Mothra thing and sings to him, but it just doesn't have the magic that Mothra's had, like, at all. And when he does come out, it just feels weird having him there. I get it shows Mechagodzilla is just that strong, that Godi needs help, but... He barely did anything. In comparison, in the last movie, Jet Jaguar did not feel out of place as he was kind of the focus of the movie up until Godi appears. And when he does, yeah, he carries Jet Jaguar the whole fight, but it's also a 2v2, so it makes more sense. Here, this is like the antithesis to Godzilla. It would be way more satisfying to see them just one-on-one, -on -one, but for some reason, this random dog dude is here. He did move really cool, though, and like actually did not help at all, so I'll let it slide. The final bout was amazing as always, Mechagodzilla is so fun to watch, mainly just because of his incredibly excessive effect use, and it is actually headache inducing, but so fun anyway. He's also brutal, a common theme so far with the latest Goaty villains. And the best part of the movie, Godzilla's crazy ass power up, he never uses again, that he gains from getting repeatedly struck by lightning. That's my goat. Magnetism. Now. This one's weird. I think I'm gonna put this one here. Because after some careful, um, deliberation with the team, I decided this one is gonna go down here. Not because I necessarily think it's bad. I just think it has flaws. The final Showa era movie. Here we see the return of the amazing Ishiro Honda, who brings such a different feeling that can't go unnoticed. I got so addicted to the electric and zany nature of Fukuda's films that when Honda came back, I forgot how different they feel. This movie has a drastic change in both tone and just plain old direction, mostly focusing on Titanosaurus, a finned aquatic monster. While I appreciate this plot, the wonderful human plot that Honda is so good at, it didn't quite catch me. Maybe because I knew it was the end and we barely got any Godzilla, Mecha, or otherwise, till the last fourth of the movie, but it didn't quite trap me in. However, Godzilla's entrance scene, with the legendary Ifukube theme song playing, I got chills. Just a wonderful, powerful display, and from then on I was hooked. Godi truly solidifies his title as the mightiest, as he takes on both Titanosaurus and Meki, with some fantastic environmental damage and effects, of which I have oh so missed. The action of course was amazing with Godi straight up boxing these guys as well as possibly the greatest Godzilla run ever as he gets back up and runs through a barrage of explosives just just fantastic stuff as well as the ending of this human plot was very sweet and I loved this character she was awesome and the themes in this one are once again solemn and subtle while still maintaining that outlandishness that we've built up the past 15 years it wasn't the best most grandiose final bout all things considered but the final shot of Godzilla returning to the sea one last time, hanging on that shot just a bit longer than usual. Truly a wild ride, and that simple end was enough for me, as we take a close on this chapter. I'm going to put this here. This is the final tier list for part one. Because obviously, we're not even halfway through these movies. We're close, but we're not halfway. So, this is still entitled to a change, to a peer review, after more entries are considered. But as of right now, this is the official Godzilla tier list for the movies. So, thank you for indulging Future James and joining me here. Back to you. I loved seeing Godzilla change from a horrific natural disaster to the defender of Earth and its people. It might have taken years off my life, but I'm glad I started this journey. And now that we've got our history down, we're going to see next how his depiction both continues to change or get reimagined in various different ways and viewpoints. Again, I wasn't the craziest Godzilla fan, but I want to be, and this has opened my eyes to the true beauty of this IP. 
Godzilla can be goofy, he can be horrifying, he can stand for very simple yet deep messages. And in this I've learned that all of these are Godzilla equally. Every film has something to offer, and even if it's the weirdest, goofiest movie I've ever laid my eyes on, it still has something it wants to say. And this big fella is the perfect messenger for whatever a film is trying to share. Godzilla gets rebooted from this point on, and while I'm excited to see where the story goes, I'm also incredibly nostalgic already to these movies. Godzilla the Hero of Earth is something we won't see again for a very long time, and I'm glad we got to experience this together. Now, as the Showa era ends, it's time for the Heisei era to begin. But we're gonna have to wait until next time. Next time, I'm gonna cover the rest of the Godzilla movies, including all the American Legendary Pictures ones. But for now, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in part two.